Aloha and welcome to World of Books. I am Mihaila Stoops and I'm hosting this talk show on books from my home in Honolulu, Maui. The war in Ukraine has worldwide consequences and we all wonder when and how it will end. But to forecast the future, we must understand the past. This is why today we will discuss Marvin Kelb's book, Imperial Gamble because it offers an excellent account of Ukrainian history up until the annexation of Crimea by Russia. My guest today is Dallas Thompson. He is a retired Air Force Major General. He is an author and commentator on national security and defense issues. And I would need about half the time allotted to the show to recite all the medals, awards and all the accomplishments that Dallas had in his career. So Dallas, I feel so privileged to have you here today and to be able to pick your brains on this topic. Thanks, Mahela. That that was very kind. That was very kind of you. Well, thank you. So let's dive into it. On August 24th, 1991, Ukraine declares its independence from USSR and outlaws the Communist Party. According to Marvin Kelb, Ukraine has not found its way out of an impasse between intolerable communism and unachievable capitalism. So notwithstanding the war, where do you think that Ukraine is right now? Is it a democracy? Is it a free market economy? And if you could tell me why you think it's a yes or a no. Well, seven years ago, when Mr. Kalb wrote this book, he clearly did not think they, they were either. Uh, uh, Petro uh, Poroshenko was still the president. Uh, very much like Russia itself, Ukraine was beleaguered with corruption, uh, participation of oligarchs in the, uh, in the government and the economy. And there was much reason, and he had much uh, doubt in uh, 2015 when the book was published, that Ukraine would ever rise to the level of being a functional democracy that could in any way be considered for either EU or NATO membership. I read the book when it first came out, so late 2015, early 2016. And I told you I just reread it again in preparation for our discussion. And one of the things that struck me is I wonder how much Mr. Kalb's uh, opinions would be changed now. Uh, can I state that Ukraine is a fully functional democracy and a uh, completely uncorrupt capitalist economy? No, I don't think so. I don't think anybody believes that. I do believe that since Poroshenko was president, that they have made tremendous advantages that should be taken into account when we discuss the current situation uh, with Russia and Ukraine. In other words, what I'm saying, Mr. Kalb wrote this book through a lens that was is seven years old. And I think one of the things we need to appreciate is how much things have changed in those seven years. You know, I find this book, even if it was written seven years ago, there was a lot of information that um, was very valuable, first yes. of all. Uh, it's, an, it's almost like an excellent textbook to prepare any experts in this area of um, Ukraine um, and Eastern Europe. And um, it also occurred to me that, um, this this book is there's so many um, so many issues that kind of repeat themselves. So the that's why you know I feel like history repeats itself. Uh, it's it's nothing new what we see with the war in Ukraine right now in a way. And um, the question that Marvin Kelp post put you know seven years ago, if what's happening with Ukraine is just Vladimir Putin's plan, or is it Russia's plan? Uh, 
um, is actually Vladimir Putin a reflection of Russia? Well, that issue applies today as well, as we see things unfolding in Ukraine, and as we see various experts come up with solutions to the crisis. I think Mr. Kalb would agree that what we're seeing today is merely a continuation of what happened. Actually, it's a continuation of what began in Georgia, in Abkhazia and South Ossetia in 2008. And when Putin realized that he could uh, cement those or freeze those conflicts in his favor, uh, Crimea in 2014 was a relatively, as Kalb describes it, was a relatively easy gamble for him. You ask about whether this is Putin's plan or Russia's plan. If you, if you believe what Cal writes and if you believe what I think most, uh, there's very few Soviet or Russian experts anymore, but the people that do have a, uh, their ear to this, they would say that Russia and Putin are the same thing, that this is wholly Putin's Russia and that uh, this is happening uh, primarily, if not solely, because of Putin's will and Putin's uh, very deeply held desire to reconstitute not the Soviet Union, but the former Russian Empire. And what we see unfolding, I think, is a continue after a strategic pause, is a continuation of what he began in Crimea, and then later in the Donbass, in uh, Luhansk, and uh, in the other breakaway republic in the east. So what do you think it's next? Um, we know, and we've discussed prior to the show, that there are some hot areas already that, um, you know, there's probability that this conflict in Ukraine is not going to stay just in Ukraine. So what's next? Any number of things. Uh, Putin's pretext to most of his actions have been to protect Russian-speaking peoples that fell into other countries, other governments, following the dissolution of the Soviet Union. That would include NATO members, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Uh, it would include the breakaway uh, area of Moldova, Transnistria. It would include Moldova itself. Uh, it could uh, it could include a move uh, against the oblast or the uh, uh, the Kaliningrad oblast between uh, Poland and Lithuania. Lithuania has attempted to enforce EU sanctions by limiting Russian imports into Kaliningrad. That was a red line for the Russians, for Putin. Uh, I understand Lithuania has since backed down to a degree. But any of these, Putin creates the pretext on his own. There's no limit, frankly, to what he could declare as a, an irritant or a uh, a reason to go to war. So he's long wanted to uh, control the south of Ukraine for the warm water ports, uh, continuing to the east from Odessa, if they could reach Odessa, I'm sorry, to the west, into Transnistria and Moldova is one possibility. Uh, a land bridge to Kaliningrad through from Belarus through Lithuania into Kaliningrad is another. The populations of the Baltic states, I believe, I'm not sure which goes with which, but are as high as 28% Russian speakers in one, 23% Russian speakers in another, and I think 8% in the third. There's, there's a distinct possibility that this would be the most dangerous for him because it would, on paper and in theory and by treaty, it would, uh, it would trip an Article 5 response from all of NATO if they were to go into any of the Baltic states. But we know that his plan has been thwarted. He originally planned to go into Kyiv, 
decapitate the existing government and replace it with a puppet government uh, due to the, the Russians' incompetence and the Ukrainians' uh, bravery and resolve, that was thwarted. So now he's working on the east in the Donbass and in the south. So in my opinion, the most likely is to solidify those gains, perhaps take Odessa, landlock Ukraine, maybe continue further west into Transnistria and Moldova. So according to, to the author, under USSR or during USSR uh, ruling, there were 186 different nationalities that all had the right to self-determination <laughs> with only one condition. And that condition was that they were all subservient to the Communist Party. There's no more Communist Party of sorts, but it seems like that subservience is still expected from these countries and these nations. And my question to you is, what really makes nation, national identity? It's cultural, is it location related? Is it religious based? Um, how far back does one have to go to accurately determine national identity? Well, that's a, that's a great question. And the answer is, I don't know. I mean, you can look at our own country and we've only been around a little over 200 years and uh, you know, we pride ourselves on being a melting pot. So what, what is our identity? Uh, we're, there's no singular religion. There's no singular race. There's no singular uh, ethnicity of any kind. Uh, but even though that's the truth, we have found for the most part, a way to describe ourselves and see ourselves as being part of this experiment, as being American. Mr. Kalb does, as you talked about, Mahila, the, the first part of the book is an outstanding history of, uh, of the region and the intertwining of Ukrainian and Russian and Belarus and uh, all of the Slavic nations and how they view Kyiv uh, on one hand as the uh, the origin the originator of the Russian Empire. They view Crimea as the soul or the the heart of the Orthodox Church because that's where Vladimir the first was baptized, the first uh, Russian Tsar to be baptized in the Orthodox Church. So if you have, if the question is, is that your national identity has to be determined by centuries of uh, homogenation of, of race, religion, and so forth, then there would be no American identity. So my point to you is, why do the Ukrainians, why are they any less able to determine their identity and their future than the United States was 200 and some years ago. Uh, I think the answer to that question lies with the Ukrainians. Mr. Kalb again does a great job describing the difference between the West of the country and the East in language. More Russian speakers are in the East, uh, more Western looking uh, Ukrainians live in the West. That's been that way apparently since the country began, even before, uh, while it was still a part of the Russian Empire, while it was a Soviet Republic. Uh, I don't see that changing. So maybe the future lies somewhere in acknowledging uh, the difference between those two regions and uh, accepting those and providing accommodation to both if there's going to be a single unified Ukraine. But to bottom line, to answer your question, I think it's the, for the Ukrainians to tell us what their national identity is. It's, um, it's definitely a very loaded question. And I have to say that as an immigrant myself, I also ask myself 
you know, I, I am an American citizen, but I was born in Romania and I lived there until uh, the age of 26. And, um, you know, sometimes I feel more American, sometimes I feel more Romanian and I, I can't quite, uh, quite define it. Um, well, so you mentioned Article 5 of um, NATO and what's something very interesting in the book is that the author points out its ambiguity, that it is purposefully ambiguous as to give an American president all the options and not draw US into the war. So looking at that um, and knowing the, what's happening in Ukraine right now, do you feel that NATO and US and the European Union have done enough to support Ukraine? Uh, that's a loaded question too. Uh, if you listen to recent Supreme Allied Commanders of Europe, like uh, Jim Stavridis or uh, Phil Breedlove, uh, they would say no. Uh, that there were things that we could have done early that would have been more demonstrative, that would clearly have uh, given Russia pause. And we have uh, we have chosen instead to incrementalize our support over time with and I, it's it's hard to say looking at this amount of money it's insulting to say it's drips and drabs but by comparison it it has come piecemeal a military professional would have told you had they been asked that if there had been a more demonstrative commitment early in the conflict that not only could lives been saved, uh, the refugee problem could have been not uh, eliminated, but ameliorated to some degree. Now, uh, having said that, are we doing, uh, are we doing enough? It, uh, it may well be. Uh, when you talk about article five, uh, Ukraine's not a NATO member, Article 5 doesn't apply. But if this conflict or the next one, if Putin achieves his aims or significant objectives in Ukraine, there's no reason to believe, and, and very respected Russian analysts believe that there's every reason if Putin is successful that he will continue to escalate and press on, even if he has to take a strategic pause, like he be, did between 2015 and this past February. So the real challenge, and Mr. Cal, frankly, in the book, Mahela, he, he does not give uh, NATO or American leadership very much credit he frankly he called into question whether any American president would honor Article Five in Europe, in the NATO Five Charter or the uh, the NATO Article Five Charter, if it involved conflict uh, conflict with Russia. I found that very uh, very interesting. That and he he now that, again this was written in 2015 or was published in 15, but uh, he made somewhat a blanket, it was ambiguous so that no American president would ever have to honor it. I hope that's not true. I hope when we sign a treaty and the treaty is ratified by the Senate, that we stick to our treaty obligations, but I'm not a politician. Yeah, it, you know, it makes me wonder if this article is ambiguous and we don't have any certainty that NATO would jump into the defense of one of its um, members, then why would um, anybody would do anything for a country that is not um, a member yet, even if obviously one of the 
contention issues and supposedly one of the biggest concerns coming from Russia is that Ukraine may become a NATO member. Which is a red line for Putin, obviously. It was a red line right. in Georgia. Uh, in 2007, I, I visited Tbilisi with a group of uh, senior officers and we had the opportunity to meet the the uh, the equivalent of the chairman of their joint chiefs of staff who happened to be a major. The president, uh, Mikhail Shalikashvili, had fired all the old Soviet senior officers and he installed this Georgian major to be the chair of the general staff. When we met him in his office and sitting around his conference table, behind his desk were two flags. One was the NATO flag, the other was the EU flag. Less than a year later, Russia involved uh, or invaded. When Poroshenko in late 14 revived the notion that Ukraine would seek eventual NATO membership, again, that was a red line for Putin. So, but Kalb also describes the, the idea that Russia had somehow been left out of this new world order after the fall of the Soviet Union, and that NATO had on its own expanded eastward, and Russia didn't have a vote in the matter. And I found that interesting the way he portrayed it, as if NATO was out selling membership tickets to the former Warsaw Pact countries, when in fact it was the opposite. It was all the Warsaw Pact countries and the Baltic Soviet republics that were beating down NATO's door, looking to join for just that very Article 5 protection purpose. So, Kalb takes Putin to task in the book, and I think accurately, for uh, rewriting history, or not rewriting, cherry picking which pieces of history apply to his worldview and discounting others. And I think that's in fact true. But I think one of the, at the end of the book, one of the things that disappointed me about Mr. Kalb's analysis was number one, his dismissiveness of the United States commitment to Article 5, he was very dis dismissive of the Ukrainian military. But he also seemed to imply that the future way out of this conflict with Russia was to renegotiate the future of Eastern Europe, as if we could take Poland and Romania, Hungary, Bulgaria, the, the Baltic states, and say, okay, sorry, it's like Lucy pulling away the football from Charlie Brown. We were just kidding. You're now going to go back into the Russian sphere of influence. That that cannot happen. We That genie cannot be put back in the bottle. But Mr. Kalb seemed to imply that that was part of the future. So we only have a few minutes left. And I want to ask you, do you have hope? Where, how do you think this is going to end? Or have you figured that out yet? Or are you still thinking about it? Hey, I'm, I'm just a poor fighter pilot that was able to graduate with a history degree out of the Air Force Academy. So I have no crystal ball. I did read what I thought was a very excellent piece just a couple of days ago, and I wish I could attribute it. I can't remember the author, but their, their premise was that perhaps a, perhaps a template for Ukraine going forward is the one that we left Korea with in 1953, which was, uh, you could call it a frozen conflict. The, the war in Korea has never been, no peace treaty has ever been signed. We are technically still at armistice uh, 70 years later, next year. Their point was, is that perhaps we'll end up with a frozen conflict with Russia 
exerting control over the Donbass, perhaps solidifying uh, gains in the South, that would that would severely limit Ukraine's ability to operate as a so sovereign nation without access to the Black Sea. But that we end up with another stalemate, it's frozen. We have this uh, agreement not to go forward, and it remains a stalemate for for years and years to come. Uh, their point again being is, is that we've all through the Cold War, we fought proxy wars with the Russians, and we never discussed, considered the use of nuclear weapons to achieve victory in any of these proxy wars. One of the best things that's happened lately is just last week, uh, Russian leadership has walked back all of the irresponsible talk that Putin and others were using at the beginning where they were flippantly talking about the use of nuclear weapons. So that's been a positive change in the past few weeks. Well, I have confidence in American and European Union diplomacy, and I can only hope that a resolution that satisfies all the parties will become apparent. Um, but again, I want to thank you for allowing me to um, ask you these hard questions, and I thank you for your input. And to our viewers, uh, all I could say is you have to read Marvin Kelp's book, Imperial Gamble, and you have to read everything on this topic because it will give you a foresight into what's um, coming. So until then, Ahui ho and read, read, read. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.